when you try to understand how a car works, uh, you are struck by how it's been engineered for a particular set of functions uh, by human beings who have worked very hard on trying to optimize all the parts uh, to make it work right. And of course, the car didn't come out of nothing. It came out of a development um, of a conveyor belt where parts were added and added. But ultimately, the cars can be understood in terms of its fully mature state. We don't have to go back and say, well, how did you make the steering wheel to understand the steering wheel? In the case of the nervous system, um, there's an interesting problem, especially with animals like human beings. And uh, a good example of this uh, comes from the fact that although there is an instruction book that makes our nervous system, it is our genome, our genetic heritage, Many of the things we do with our nervous system, especially human beings, more perhaps than any other animal, a huge amount of our behavioral repertoire, if you will, does not come from our genes. If you happen to um, be born into a family whose parents speak Russian, you will speak Russian. That same child, if they're born or adopted at an early age into a family of people who speak English, will speak English. If you're given a tennis racket at a young age, you probably will play tennis reasonably well. If you're given a violin, you'll be able to play violin. If you're given a piano, you'll be able to play piano to some degree. These are not because you have genetic predispositions. It just happens to be that if you experience these things in early life, you have a greater skill with them in later life. And language is the most impressive example of all, that we all become expert at the language we learn, language or languages we learn as a child. And there's no genetics for this. This is not that you have a gene for that language. You just have an environment for that. So ultimately, your behavior when it comes to language, but also your behavior when it comes to buttoning your shirt or learning how to shave or driving a car or learning how to read or any, virtually anything an adult human being does has as its origin the development of the nervous system in early life. That is, you can think of the brain as a learning machine rather than simply as a machine that gives you a behavioral repertoire. The behavioral repertoire it gives you is largely related to the behaviors you experience through practice and sensory experience in early life. However, once you've learned something, it's stably maintained in that nervous system, as if it were built in the way the behaviors of animals that are born knowing things come in. So for example, a dragonfly, you know, this um, animal that is an insect, it has these long wings and it catches mosquitoes, it unfurls its wings and as soon as it flies, it flies perfectly with no practice. Built into its nervous system are the, is a genetic instruction book that makes a flying animal that knows how to catch mosquitoes without any training. It's built in. You look at a human baby, you find a baby that does virtually nothing well. It can cough, it can pee, it can poop, it breathes, but if you turn it over, it can't even turn itself over. And it takes a human baby a year to learn how to walk. That's ridiculous. There's no animal that takes so long to learn how to walk. And in the United States, at least, another 15 years to get the driver's license. And three years after that, when you're 18, you finally leave the nest. It's a, you know, a very slow process. And why would a nervous system develop slow, slowly? Why would, I have students in my lab who are graduate students who are 26, 27. I have postdoctoral fellows who are still considered students who are over 30. We still call them trainees. We're still <laughs> learning at this advanced age. And this is part of the great strength and weakness of being a human being. The strength is that we end up with a nervous system that is tuned to the world we find ourselves in. And the great weakness is that we are helpless for a vast part of our life. We are not self-sufficient until we're quite old. And um, if you want to understand how the brain works, 
you're basically going to have to understand how it is that information about the world gets instantiated into the physicality of the brain. And I'm going to give you one example of this. If you learn to ride a bicycle as a child, uh, you pretty much have that skill for the rest of your life. And I, like most children uh, from my generation, I learned how to ride a bicycle. And then I, when I was in graduate school, I did not have a bicycle. And then for the subsequent 10 or 15 years, I didn't have a bicycle as well. So there were several decades of my adult life when I never rode a bicycle. And then um, my wife and I moved from where I was living here, and I was beginning to grow, but not up, but out. I was getting fat, and my wife suggested that we get some exercise. So I went to a bicycle store, and I hadn't been on a bicycle for a very long time. I got on a bicycle, and you know how it is at a bicycle store, they let you ride the bicycle a little bit outside. And so I was very nervous, but I got on the bicycle, and after, I was a little shaky, but it was only maybe eight or nine seconds. And then suddenly I was riding fine. So something about learning to ride a bicycle as a child was stably maintained in my brain. Whereas people who don't know how to ride a bicycle as a child, if you give them a bicycle as an adult, it's a very hard job to learn how to ride a bicycle if you've never had experience as a child. So something physically was changed in my brain that was stably maintained without practice for decades that I could use again later. And in fact, all memories are like that. There are many memories that are buried in our mind that we don't have access to in the sense that we're not thinking about them, but if we're prompted, they can be brought up to the surface. They're just sitting there waiting for that moment. And there are probably lots of memories you have that will never come to the surface because nothing will ever prompt them. But what is the form of that kind of information? It's some kind of physical structure. It's probably in the wiring diagram of the brain. And it's probably through a developmental mechanism that allowed experience and use of an idea or a task to change the wiring diagram in a way that you now have a stable rendition of that skill built into the nervous system. And this is a deep and mysterious question of what do those skills and those memories look like physically? What is a memory? And that is uh, a, really a developmental question. It's a question of how the brain goes from a state of not knowing things to a state of knowing things. How did that wiring diagram change over the course of experience? There are lots of things to say about uh, the speed of learning. Uh, I think a lot of parents are eager to have their kids reading early and doing very well in school at a young age, the implication being that the fast learners are the smartest. It's worth mentioning that Albert Einstein didn't say a word until he was five and that many of the people who are most successful in fields seem a bit immature to other people. They're baby-like or more childlike, perhaps, than their more mature colleagues. I think we all go through this trend, but the people who go through it the slowest may be the ones, actually, who have the big advantage here, not the ones who do it fast. There are stories, uh, and I, I've read a, an interesting book about this, of, of, of children who are remarkably um, precocious. They, they know how to do things at an earlier age than, than other kids. They, they are clearly uh, what you would call a genius at a young age. And then this book traces their uh, life trajectory later on. And, and, and they do learn extraordinarily fast, but they plateau just at an earlier age. And they don't necessarily become uh, great thinkers. They just reach the adult state quicker. They just go through it at a much quicker rate. So I'm not sure uh, that there's any real advantage uh, to being a quick learner. Uh, the it, most important thing is, of course, to continue to take information in about the world. And maybe this is what separates humans from most other animals that have to survive on their own at an earlier stage. So they can't keep being in this learning state. They have to grow up quickly. And growing up quickly has a consequence. It may be that they learn less about the world than an animal that has the leisure to keep learning into middle age or even into old age. One of the interesting features of a 
brain whose behavior is generated by experience with the world is that if that's how people's brains are being developed, then the culture of a society is evolving due to the use of our brains in a particular world that is itself changing because of what people are doing in it. So there is this idea that in science fiction that humans will, our brains will get bigger and bigger and bigger and will get smarter and smarter and smarter. I see something actually quite different thinking about it in this way, which is that as a community, human beings will do more and more impressive things as we join together uh, the internet is a good example of using many brains to solve problems and using technology like computers to solve problems. So humans will keep advancing, but there's no need for human brains to get bigger. <laughs> there's only a need for human brains to allow this cultural evolution to continue happening. In fact, there may be a limit to what humans individually can know, and there's no evolutionary force to make us smarter. There's just an evolutionary force to make us work as a society, because as a society, we become much more powerful than any one of us. And that is basically what the internet or countries or governments are. They're consolidations of human beings into bigger entities than a single brain. If the development of the brain is a critical part of its uh, maturation into what it becomes, then we have to pay a lot of attention to early developmental influences. Uh, early education, um, the noxious effects of abuse of children will have long lasting effects on people's behavior by virtue of the fact that our brains are being molded by those experiences in a permanent way. And it is why adults in different countries or of di different religious beliefs have such a hard time getting along, perhaps, because their brains, from a neurobiological standpoint here, have already made up their minds about the way the world is. These children would have gotten along, but by the time they're grown ups, it's too late. And I think understanding this, almost in a political way, as a, a, a sort of policy way, might change the way you think uh, about how we solve the world's problems. <laughs>